All right, so it's my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, Alexander Sigal. Um, I never asked you how you pronounce your last name. The E is name. silent, Sigal. Hmm? The E is silent, Sigal. Sigal, okay, yeah, so French style. Um, and uh, uh, Alex is, uh, uh, teaches at uh, Queens College, uh, part of the CUNY system in New York City. Um, teaches Russian uh, literature and language there. Uh, but uh, he mainly is uh, spending his time supporting himself as a freelance translator and writer. And uh, part of that was, for example, in 2015, he was awarded an NEA Fellowship in Literary Translation for his work on the poet of the St. Petersburg Philological School, Michael Ermin. And uh, he also guest edited the spring 2015 Russia issue of the Atlanta Review. Uh, and blogged about it for a week on Best American Poetry. He's published his own poems in a variety of outlets and, uh, and uh, above all his translations of Russian Silver Age and contemporary Russian poetry in uh, places like Harvard Review, New England Review, uh, Pen America, uh, Words Without Borders, and so forth, and World Literature Today. Um, and uh, so his uh, monograph, uh, Russian Absurd, Daniel Harm's Selected Writings, appeared in 2017 in the Northwestern World Classics series. And uh, uh, Harm's, uh, the Russian writer, is the topic of today's uh, lecture. So um, without further ado, please welcome Alexander Sigov. I just want to say, if you have a chance to make it today, for you will see some connections to contemporary writing uh, from what I will uh, be talking about and reading from today. Uh, the uh, cover is um, by a Russian-American poet uh, tra and trans Ahmatova translator and a wonderful artist, Nina Kosman. Some of you might have heard of her. Uh, really looking forward to the actual uh, Work. Yeah, filed us in the very last minute category, but it's today at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. We would love to see it. And it's the launch issue for our Traffic of Europe Russian issue, which Alex has co edited, and it is packed. Um, you'll get notice of the issue itself um, um, in a few days, but this is our launch event for it. So Alex and I will be reading from several of the writers, and it's pretty fascinating stuff. So if you can make it uh, 3 p.m. in Sparks, you're welcome there. And uh, I have my work cut out for me. I prepare something very specific about harm, sort of about the, the spiritual dimension and the development uh, of his writing. And, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, sort of uh, this development from uh, uh, absurdism through theater, of, uh, the absurd in theater of cruelty to, uh, to uh, existentialism. I really won't be able to do that because I realized uh, when I met Tom Thomas yesterday that I really need to fill uh, a lot of background uh, uh, because most people here are in comparative uh, literature. So I will begin with harms and sort of then backtrack. And I thought the best way to begin is actually by, uh, by um, right in the middle rather than sort of like tracing it from early, middle, late. I will start in the middle in 1933. He was born in 1905 died in 1942. He starved to death in a psychiatric hospital. Um, his entire life's work fits into um, less than 15 years, late 20s through 1940. And um, so he was uh, arrested for the first time in 1931, exiled to Kursk for two years. And that was sort of that uh, both mental and spiritual break and, uh, and that kind of a transition to more serious and mature writing, but you know, sort of age-wise. And I will begin with a letter that he writes. Uh, I try to incorporate very different uh, kinds of materials. His work, he was only known as a children's writer in his lifetime. The mature writing was never intended with any hope to be published. Uh, fills thousands of pages of notebooks, um, rescued by chance, um, uh, after uh, the archive was rescued uh, in suitcase suitcases after the building had been bombed by a friend. And uh, so there are very many different kinds of experimental writings uh, 
and he makes no distinction. He will incorporate poetry and playlets into prose pieces. Some are standard narratives. He's playing with different genre forms, fables, and so on. So just uh, I will begin with a letter to give you a sense of his aesthetics. And this is from 1933 when he returns to Petersburg, uh, Leningrad at that point, from exile. Second. <clears throat> Monday, October 16, 1933, Petersburg, it has a little inscription, a little poem. Talent grows, destroying building, the sign, sorry, talent grows, destroying building, the sign of stagnation is well-being. Dear Claudia Vasilyevna, you are a remarkable and genuine person. As much as it grieves me not to be able to see you, I won't be inviting you to the children's theater or to come to my city. How heartwarming it is to know that there still exists one human being animated by dreams. I don't know what word one can use to express that force which so delights me in you. I usually call it simply purity. I have been thinking about how wonderful it is that which is primal, how wonderful unmediated reality is, how wonderful sun and grass and stone and water and birds and the beetle and the fly and the man. But a shot, a shot glass and knife or a key and comb are just as beautiful. If I were to go blind and lose my hearing and all my senses, then how could I possibly lose all this beauty? Everything has vanished and there is nothing left for me anymore. But here I've been given back my sense of touch and almost immediately the whole world has reappeared. I acquired hearing and the world became significantly better yet. I got back all my other senses and the world was better still. The world began to exist as soon as I allowed it inside myself. Granted, it may still be in disarray, but at least it is. However, I then began to put the world in order. And now art has appeared, has made its appearance with us. Only then did I, un did I understand the distinction between the sun and the comb. But at the same time, I realized that these two are one and the same. Now my task is to create the proper order. I am preoccupied with this, and it is everything I think about. I talk about it, attempt to relate, describe, sketch it, dance it, construct it. I am the creator of the world, and this is the most important thing about me. How could I possibly not think about it all the time? Everything I do, I infuse with the thought that I am the world's creator. And I'm not simply making a boot, a tall story, of course, but first and foremost, I create a new thing. It's not sufficient for me to turn out a boot that is comfortable, durable, and beautiful. It is important that this boot exhibit the same order which is in the whole world, so that the world's order not be, not be sullied, soiled by contact with nail and skin, so that despite the boot's form, it would retain its own form, remain as it has been, that it remain pure. This is that same purity which permeates all art. When I write poems, what seems most important to me is not the idea, not the content or form, nor that nebulous concept we call quality, but something even hazier and more incomprehensible to the rational mind, but which is clear to me, and I hope to you as well, dearest Claudia Vasilevna, this purity of order. This purity is one and the same as the one in the sun, and in the grass, in a person, and in poems. Genuine art stands in the order of the set of primary reality. It creates the world, and it is the first, and is, it is its first reflection. It is absolutely real. But dear Lord, what trifles genuine art consists in? The Divine Comedy is a great work, but Pushkin's The Moon is Rising Through the Misty Waters is no less wonderful. For both the one and the other contain that purity and consequently the same proximity to reality, i.e. towards independent existence. 
These are no longer mere words and thoughts printed on paper. It is a thing just as real as the crystal inkwell which stands before me on my writing desk. It seems to me these verses that have become a thing may be lifted off the paper and flung at the window and the glass will shatter. This is what words are capable of. But, on the other hand, how pitiable and helpless these same words may be. I never read the newspapers. This is a fictitious and not a created world. It is nothing but pathetic, worn-down type offset on poor quality, splintery paper. Does man require anything in life besides art? I think not. He needs nothing else. It encompasses everything that is real. I think purity may be found in all things, even in how a man eats his soup. I think you did the right thing coming to Moscow. You're able to take walks in the streets and act in a starving theater. There's more purity in that than living here in this comfortable room acting in a children's theater. I am always suspicious of all good fortune. Today is a Polotsky. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about the circle, right? The very this uh, circle of writers uh, uh, that have come to be known as Russian Absurd. And Zabolotsky was the most uh, established of the group who's recognized as the major uh, Russian poet. Today, Zabolotsky came to visit me. He's been taking a keen interest in architecture for a long time now and has written a long poem. Uh, Zabolotsky was arrested and uh, sentenced to 20 years of hard labor. The poem did not survive. We only know it from this. He has written a long poem in which he's expressed many wonderful thoughts about architecture and human life. I know that many people will be amazed by it, but I also know that it is a bad poem. <laughs> only in several places, almost accidentally, is it good. These are two separate categories. The first category is comprehensible and simple. Here, everything is so clear that one knows exactly what one is supposed to do. It's understood what one must pursue and how this may be accomplished. Here, the way is apparent. This is fertile ground for discussion, and one day a literary critic will write an entire tome on the subject, and a commentator six volumes explaining and interpreting it. Here, everything is as it should be. Of the second category, the ineffable, no one will utter a word even though it is precisely that which makes architecture and all our thoughts about human life beautiful. It's incomprehensible, insensible, and at the same time wonderful, this second category. But it can't be achieved. It is foolish to even seek it. There are no paths leading to it. It is precisely this second category which forces a man to suddenly drop everything and take up mathematics and then after having abandoned math, suddenly take up Arab music, and then get married, and then having sliced up his wife and son, lie in the field on his stomach, examining a flower. That's also a parody of Zabolotsky, who's this great nature writer. Yes, this is the most unfortunate of categories which makes a man a genius. By the way, I'm no longer talking here about Zabolotsky, who's yet to slaughter his wife or take up mathematics. Dear Claudia Vasilievna, I am not at all making fun of your visits to the zoo. There was a time when I too visited our local zoological garden daily. I'd made there the acquaintance of a particular wolf and a pelican. If you allow me, I will one day tell you in detail how splendidly we passed the time together. If you'd like, I will describe for you how I once lived an entire summer at the Lachtinsky Zoological Station in the castle of Count Steinbach Fermora, living on a diet of life worms and Nestle's milk powder in the company of a nearly mad zoologist, spiders, ants, and snakes. I am genuinely delighted that you take your walks like so in the zoological garden, especially if you take walks there not just for the sake of walking, but also to observe the animals. I will fall in love with you even more tenderly, yours, Daniel Harms. So, <laughs> a few words about Daniel Harms. Uh, um, uh, so, 19, birth 1905. Um, he was the son of uh, Dan, uh, Ivan Yuvachov, who uh, had. 
in the 1880s had been a member of a revolutionary group, uh, People's Will, the same revolutionary group that um, uh, Lenin's brother, Alexander Ulanov, belonged to. They were arrested, I believe 17 of them sentenced to death. They sat in the same jail. Uh, Ulanov was executed. Um, uh, like Dostoevsky, Yuvachov had uh, a similar experience, right, condemned to death uh, at the last moment, reprieve, sentenced to eight years of hard labor. Like, um, like uh, Dostoevsky, he also has a religious conversion experience in his, uh, in his heart, hard labor. Afterwards, he um, uh, goes to Sakhalin, uh, on Sakhalin, uh, after the exile uh, and sentence, people generally had to uh, have, uh, be, stay in exile. And so he wound up working at the penal colony in Sakhalin and became a very close friend of Anton Chekhov, who was there as a doctor for something like six months. And so, um, uh, and then one additional fact is that uh, upon returning, he becomes a cult, clo his father becomes a close uh, religious philosopher himself and a close acquaintance of Leo Tolstoy. So, in fact, uh, uh, when the father uh, received news of his son's birth in 1905, it was by telephone call at Yasna Palyana uh, at, at Tolstoy's estate. So, these three uh, male figure, older male figures. Um, uh, Chekhov dies in 1905, the same year that, uh, that Daniel Harmus, Daniel Yorvachov was born. Um, and uh, Tolstoy dies a short time later, 1910. Um, but these three figures sort of become uh, uh, sort of a push off point. He changes his name to Harms, which is just a play. play uh, he spelled it differently. He did add it as a legal a part of his legal name, which of harms, but it was a way of distancing himself from his more famous father and so forth, as well as from his relig conservative religious philosophy. And I will read to you um, a couple of short selections that are um, that are uh, he constantly is parodying various genre forms, and primary among them are Chekhov and, Tol and Tolstoy. So I think it will be interesting to read to you a couple of short ones uh, like that. Uh, the good doctor, on the bed, right, <clears throat> on the bed, writhing in pay, pain, lay a young man. This is from 1940, a very long, uh, old, piece, uh, a very late piece. On the bed, writhing in pain, lay a young man, translucent to the point of disappearing. On the chair sat a woman, likely his mother, covering her face with uh, with her hands. A gentleman wearing a starched collar, probably a doctor stood beside the nightstand. Yellow drapes were drawn over the windows. The door creaked and a large tomcat peeked into the room. The gentleman in the starch collar kicked the cat on the nose with his boot. The cat vanished. The young man moaned. The young man said something. The doctor-like gentleman listened. The young man said, the boats are sailing. The gentleman bent forward. How are you, my dear friend? The gentleman asked, leaning closer. The young man lay silent on his back, his face turned to the wall. He remained silent. All right, then, the gentleman said, straightening, you refuse to speak to your friend. Fine. The gentleman shrugged and moved to the window. Give me a boat, the young man said. The gentleman standing by the window snickered. Eight minutes passed. The, young, the youth fixed his eyes on the gentleman in the starch collar and said, doctor, please tell me, honestly, am I dying? 
See here, the doctor said, fingering the chain on his, uh, of his pocket watch. I'd rather not answer your question. Indeed, I don't even have t or the right to answer it. What you just said is plenty, the young man said. I know now that there's no hope. You're just imagining, said the doctor. I didn't say any, anything of the sort about hope. Doctor, you must take me for a fool, but I assure you, I'm not stupid, and I understand my condition perfectly. The doctor snickered and shrugged. Your condition is such that it would be impossible for you to understand it. I went to, uh, did want to find this other uh, Chekhov parody. Nineteen thirty seven. The uh of, uh sorry, once again. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll find it la later. Uh, there's, uh, I'll, I'll just skip back sort of and uh, go to the uh, Tolstoy parody. It's called The Fate of the Professor's Wife. One time, a certain professor ate something that didn't agree with him, and he started to vomit. <clears throat> His wife came over and said, what's with you? And the professor says, nothing. So the wife left again. The professor lay down on the ottoman. He lay there for a while, rested up, and went off to his job. And at work, a surprise awaited him. They've shrunk his salary from 650. They've left him with only 500 rubles. The professor tried this and that, but it was no use. The professor went to see the director, and the director showed him the door. He went to the accountant, and the accountant said, talk to the director. So the professor got on the train and set off for Moscow. On the way, the professor came down with the flu. He got to Moscow and couldn't even get off the train unaided. They put the professor on a stretcher and took him to the hospital. The professor lay in the hospital less than four days and died. They burned the professor's body in the crematorium, placed the ashes in the little jar, and sent them off to his wife. So the professor's wife was sitting there, drinking her coffee. Suddenly the doorbell rang. What's this? There's a package for you. The wife, rejoicing and grinning from ear to ear, stuffed a ruble coin in the mailman's hand and quickly unwrapped the package. She looked and saw inside with, uh, was a little jar of ashes with a note, this is all that remains of your spouse. The wife got very upset, cried for close to three hours, and then went off to bury the little jar of ashes. She wrapped the jar in the newspaper and carried it to the park of the first five-year plan, formerly known as the Tavrychiski Garden. The professor's wife had picked out a more secluded alley, and just as she was about to bury the jar, here comes the night watchman, the watchman. Hey, the guard yelled, what are you doing there? The professor's wife got scared and said, I just want to trap some frogs in this little jar. Well, the guard said, that's all right with me, but just keep in mind, walking on the grass is strictly prohibited. When the watchman left, the professor's wife buried the little jar in the ground, stopped the earth around it flat, and went off for a walk in the park. But in the park, some sailor kept pestering her. Come with me, let's go, he says. Let's go and sleep together. She says, why sleep when it is daytime? And he just keeps repeating, sleep this, sleep that, and indeed the prof professor's wife becomes very drowsy. She's, uh, she's walking down the street and falling asleep. Racing around her are some strange people, blue ones, green ones, and all she wants to do is go to sleep. She's walking, uh, she's walking in her sleep, and she dreams a dream. It seems Leo Tolstoy is walking towards her with a chamber pot in his hands. She asks him, what's the meaning of this? And he gestures with his finger at the chamber pot and says, well, he says, I have made something here, and now I'm carrying it off for the entire world to see. Let everyone, he says, look at it. 
The professor's wife also starts to take a closer look, and she sees, it seems, that it is no longer Leo Tolstoy, but a barn, and inside the barn sits a laying hen. The professor's wife starts trying to catch the chicken, but the chicken scuttled under the couch and was peeking out from under it now, only now as a rabbit. The professor's wife started crawling under the couch after the rabbit and woke up. She looks around, and indeed, she is lying under the couch. The professor's wife climbs out from under the couch and sees it is indeed her room. And there's the table with the unfinished coffee. On the table is a note, this is all that remains of your spouse. The professor's wife started crying again and sat down to finish her coffee. Suddenly, the doorbell rings. What's this? We're going for a ride. Where? The professor's wife asked. To the madhouse, the strange people say. The professor's wife started screaming and resistant, but the people grabbed her and drove her off to the insane asylum. And so, sitting there on a bunk bed in the madhouse is an entirely normal professor's wife with a fishing rod in her hands, trying to catch some sort of invisible fish swimming around on the floor. This professor's wife is but one sad example of how many unfortunates there are in life who occupy a position other than the one that was intended for them. So, and I will pause here and sort of uh, some back, more background. Um, and I have a little cheat, well, this is like a, a little cheat sheet here to fill in sort of like the back background. So, um, uh, the Russian futurists were basic. Uh, sorry, the uh, Russian absurdists were basically late to the Russian futurism uh, party. So to backtrack a little bit, um, their great model was the poet Vladimir Khlebnikov, um, who um, was uh, interestingly, along with uh, the painter Vasily Kandinsky one of the first people, this is circa 1907-1908, to engage in this sort of what we would call modern, you know, what would later become known as modernism in writing. And I won't go so much into Russian futurism other than to say that <coughs> Klebnikov starved to death in uh, 1922, when uh, uh, this generation, born in 1905, uh, that became known as Russian, uh, the Russian absurdists, they were teenagers. Still, their connection to Russian futurism, the people who survived, were Alexei Kruchonev and the Russian painter Kazimir Malevich. Um, the Oberiu, as hopefully what I read kind of uh, uh, intimates, uh, I won't have much time to talk about it, um, were, um, um, uh, is an acronym for Abizinenia Realnova Eskustva, the Union of Real Art which basically said right, that, uh, that art is independent, is an uh, independent existence separate from the common reality. That words essentially have their own. This is this kind of essentialism that rejects any kind of materialism and so on. Of course, it was entirely not approved right, uh, on the grounds of social realism. And so they were, they were suppressed. The, these were performances, essentially. They were theater, they were performance artists. Um, uh, 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 scandalous, as well, like the Russian futurism. And so in 1920, by 1927, 1928, just as soon as they get, get going, they lose permission, they are uh, forbidden to do these kinds of performances, but they do find a space in the workshop of Kazimir Malevich. Right, the group, the, that, great sort of abstract, you know, uh, late abstra abstraction, uh, suprematism, and so forth, the square, and so on, who had been uh, the artist who, uh, who uh, actually did the stage design, the costumes, for the first great Russian future opera, uh, Victory Over the Sun, 1913. And so to give you the full background, I would have to spend a little bit of time on that period, 1911, 1914. Right? And there are two important breaks with the previous generation, which was already the second generation of Russian symbolism. I'm going to backtrack in the five minutes I have left, so I'd like to fill this in. Um, so, um, um, uh, they did not call themselves Russian futurists. They called themselves Futurians, 
The word for it in the original Russian is actually Budetlyanye, the people of the future. Um, uh, very different from, Rus uh, from the Italian. They made that distinction very clearly. There was no worship of machine. There was, but actually it was a parody of that. Um, uh, with, uh, of, of, great, of great importance was uh, elements of, uh, of um, uh, folk revival, for example. They were really going back to these uh, very um, uh, primitive, they were neo-primitivist, primitivist roots. Um, uh, and so that was one uh, of the, uh, of the wing, uh, wings of Russian modernism, right? Um, and they get going in 1913, 1914. Uh, the, um, the person you probably, uh, so the father of Russian futurism was David Burluk. They were, many of them were also trained artists. David Burluk was sort of like the mentor to the youngest one of that generation, which is Vladimir Mayakovsky, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, Vladimir Klebnikov was sort of like in the, in, in, uh, the middle one in age. Um, the uh, other break with Russian formalism was acmeism. Uh, the people you are familiar with, uh, there were six of them. There was sort of like a left wing and a right wing. As you can imagine, there were these political divisions. Uh, uh, it emerges in 1911 out of something called uh, the, the, uh, the Poets Guild, the Guild, founded by a primitivist poet uh, by the name of uh, Gradetsky and uh, Anna Akhmatova's husband, uh, uh, Gumilov, Lev Gumilov. And um, um, they were kind of more, it was much more romantic. And they were trying just to bring uh, 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 some earthly, concrete reality to this very flighty nature of Russian, uh, Russian um, uh, symbolism. Um, and uh, it gains then its name, Acmeism, which means the best of world culture, sort of. Uh, in 1914, um, uh, it's Mondostam's word, uh, the, the critic uh, poet who sort of categorized it as such his name was Mikhail Kuzmin, and he actually used Anna Akhmatova's poetry, uh, and his phrase for it uh, is um, beautiful clarity. My thought is that Anna Akhmatova has become so prominent, almost to uh, uh, sort of like overshadowing everyone else in, Ru in the Russian Silver Age poetry <coughs> because of that beautiful clarity, that it is so limpid, it's so in a way, concrete. It is still symbolism, right? But it, it is very much uh, 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 concerned with uh, everyday reality. In her terms, very much uh, sort of like this, the social reality, uh, in the sense of uh, the you know, society. Um, so, um, uh, to um, to give it a little bit sort of more background, there are two ge generations of symbolism before that. Uh, and I, so I'm going to actually backtrack to the beginning. <coughs> there, um, what I wanted to give you, and this is what I'll leave you with, sort of, is um, it is fascinating that it is possible to map over Russian uh, modernism to uh, the Western modernism by simply looking at the generations. And so at the bottom there, I sort of give you examples, right? These transitional figures, William Batulietz, William Batulietz Frost, um, um, Gertrude Stein, right, born in the six, 1860s, 1870s, and then this high modernism, and so the two people who bracket is T.S. Eliot, 1888, and E.E. E. Cummings, 1893. What's fascinating is that if you look up at the top, right, and Russian Civil Age generally refers to sort of like the first quarter of the century uh, as the Silver Age, Big four, the big four that pretty much everyone in the West knows are Akhmatova, Pasnarek, Mandrishan, Tsitaeva. They are born consecutively in that sort of frame between 1880 and 1893. Akhmatova born in 89, Pasnarek 1890, Osip Mandrishan 1891, Marina Tsitaeva 1892. And I guess sort of like um, the last part that I, I want to say is that this is a kind of a world culture that there's a certain zeitgeist. But one can very easily identify right, these elements that are, everybody was influenced by. 
So, and I'll first address sort of like as a world culture. Well, for one thing is, of course, the influence of uh, French symbolism, right? And I'm not going to go through all the generations there, but what essentially happens is they come into translation into Russian. That first oldest generation of Russian symbolists, and I'm looking here at the next one, right? Uh, there are, so first there are transitional figures. Vladimir Solovyov, who was an important philosopher, maybe I'll say a word about him at the end. Right, Anyansky and Sologub. Uh, the interesting thing about Anyansky and Sologub is that they were both teachers, they were both professors, and they really didn't publish their work until the early, about 1900, between 1900 and 1905. More even importantly, they, they, tr they were translators, along with Vyacheslav Ivanov, they translated and made um, French symbolism available in Russia. Right, that it all comes into Russian. The other important figure as a translator, and the sort of like late romantic uh, symbolist poet, is Constantin Balmond. He brings Edgar Allan Poe into Russian at about the same time, at the very, in the 1890s, at the end of the century. And then there are, of course, other, other sort of uh, important uh, cult cultural influences that all of, uh, all of us share. Um, a uh, huge influence uh, in 1907 was the publication of uh, Bergson's Creative Evolution. Um, another huge influence, going back to the 19th century, is uh, Theosophy. We know of Madame Blavatsky in the early, earlier in the century, then it's uh, Steiner, uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner, right, and at, towards the end. Um, that generation traveled and lived in Paris and Germany. So, for example, André Bailey was a student of Steiner and so forth. And, uh, and his work, again, if you look uh, at the second generation of, um, of um, Russian symbolism, is very much influenced by uh, ideas of theosophy. Um, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, oh, I'm sorry, of course, I forgot perhaps the most important, and that is how uh, the work of Nietzsche comes into Russian shortly after he dies. So he dies in 1900, and that is exactly the year that, I'm um, trying to remember, it was, uh, 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 Thus Spoke Zarathustra, that is the first book that becomes available in 1900. And uh, through that decade, all of Nietzsche comes into Russian. I think in 1912, it is uh, uh, the birth of tragedy. Um, and, um, and this is not to imply that those are the only influences because there are, there are important religious philosophers. And I would only note here, in conclusion, uh, Vladimir Solovyov, who was an, in a way important poet in his own right, uh, but primarily influenced everyone as a religious philosopher. His, um, um, it was a kind of a seeking of unity. Uh, ecumenist in the sense of a uh, reunification between the Western Church and the Eastern Church, but even a gr this grander notion that re rejects materialism, rejects uh, rejects um, rejects um, 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 uh, positivism, and uh, seeks uh, sort of this return to these Aristotelian essentialism. And um, um, I'm going to stop here for now. And if you have to leave, so we have five minutes for questions and answers. If you have to leave, you will go, and then I will read a couple of more things, sort of like to exemplify the spiritual part. I, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know this is, I know this is like, that's why the cheat sheet, sort of like if you're interested in mapping, I didn't even get to mention the art. These things are inseparable from the music and the art of the period, right? So that we're talking about, um, so the uh, for this first generation of modernism and music is Alexander Skriabin, who dies young, very much influenced by theosophy as well. These uh, these um, these um, sp sort of like spiritualist mystical notions. Uh, he called it the circle of fifths, right? Uh, just like with Bieli and with Klebnikov, there's a lot of um, theorizing about, um, about um, synesthesia, about literally mapping over color and numbers onto like uh, sounds uh, in words and so on, as well as um, um, uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that that uh, that um, that uh, language. Uh, well, first of all, that uh, uh, right, this, this this sort of whatever higher idea, uh, you know, the uh, ideal ideal forms, right, that are sort of that unify everything, um, and uh, the same with art, right. Uh, so the great revolution and abstraction is Kandinsky. Uh, about the same time, he goes through this folk revival in the late 1900s, right, so, so on, 1906 to 1908, and works his way through this pure abstraction. But as you know, right, uh, sorry, uh, Kandinsky's um, uh, Concerning the Spiritual in Art, 1912. These are all um, abstraction initially, we're, we're really about higher forms. Is, are there questions? It's hard for me to know sort of like what to focus on. I hope that wasn't too much. Well, um, the Silver Age of, of, that you're talking about, all the writers, poets and such, they formed movements and they had proclamations and programs, which is not characteristic of all stages of Russian culture or no, poetry in general. It How was, do you explain that? Yeah, this was something that shook the world for from 1911 to 1914, mostly there were still some late other like late generation of that. The last one is Im Imaginism. That's the uh, like uh, the generation born at the very end of the century who were sort of like teens at the time that this was happening. And so the last uh, movement proper of uh, Russian futurism is Imaginism, partly inspired by Imagism, right, which is 1917. Right, but um, I, this is, it, it starts going in 1900, really. These are millenarian, right? They're almost part of this kind of millenarianism. The reason I'm so fascinated and work so much in that period right now is that I feel that we're on the same cusp right now. That an old world is dying, a new one is, uh, is to be born. Um, we are not having this kind of, you know, sp uh, spiritual intellectual ferment yet. But uh, does that answer the question? Yes. No. Uh, the old, <laughs> the, uh, the old life was upset, both, uh, both in the, you know, primarily in the material sense, right? In terms of uh, progress, uh, progress, uh, industrial industry, but also, you know, God is dead, uh, uh, and so forth. By the way. Um, so Kazimir Malevich, whom uh, the Russian absurdists were sort of like, uh, he let them do their productions in the studio. Um, uh, he, gave, he, he said something like, I'm an old fart, you're young farts, we can, do, we can work together. And he gave him a direction. He said, go and stop progress. <laughs> it's easy enough. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm interested just to, Technical question, really. Uh, you talk about the role of translation in uh, conveying French symbolism and some other things, right? Translation into Russian. Whereas earlier, like in the 18th century and early 19th century, it seems that uh, French was really, you know, stuff could stay in French. Like English literature had to be translated into French, but not necessarily into Russian. Uh, and as you know, about half of War and Peace is in French, right? You know, uh, so French was this uh, lingua franca, right, for culture, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, uh, is that, was there a shift in, did, did translating into Russian, did it reach a different kind of audience than had been the case in the past, a less aristocratic audience, or, or was there a shift in education, or is my perception there just There was also kind of, already a shift to German as the primary second language as well. These were personal choices. It's very hard to address it very generally. And you see that in the immigration, once they leave. Some of them go to Germany, some of them go to Berlin, some of them go to Paris. But that was uh, also the case with the, germ with the, uh, with the uh, symbolist generation as well. Um, yeah. Well, if I, I can add something to that, I mean, Valery Brusov, one of the main symbolists who also translated a lot from French into Russian, he says, 
the point of translating into Russian is, of course, it's not to address people who are so uneducated that they can't read it in French. Because they don't even <laughs> deserve to read it. The point is to create a Russian poem that's inspired by this and sort of illustrates that we, the Russians, are capable of also creating this kind of symbolist literature. But of course, the educated reading public would have been perfectly able to read it in French. They didn't need I, translations. And I just also wanted to add is that it was a, exactly that it was a, a, an act of cultural appropriation. And in fact, that becomes the school of Russian translation. If you read the, uh, if you compare the Russian translations to the original, you will you will just recognize the shadow of an original poem. Uh, uh, sorry, Balmont brings uh, Poe into Russian. They're wonderful poems. They could not be more distant from the Poe originals. <laughs> and then you realize, oh my god, these things really are untranslatable. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Pasternak's great contribution was translating Shakespeare into Russian. And Russian often remarks how much better past, you know, Pasternak's Shakespeare is than the original. Shakespeare. <laughs> May I please? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your extended presentation of Russian futurism, modernism, a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm actually curious uh, uh, about uh, two um, long quotations that you placed. Yes, that's what I just wanted to material. make sure to get to it at the end. Yeah, you just opposed them, uh, the one by Harms and the other by uh, uh, Vedensky. I just which, wanted that as a summary. Yeah. Which actually represent different attitudes to verbal reality. Uh, which are contradictory to each other in this attitude to verbal reality. Could you please... Uh, How do you contradict? I'm not sure which harms you're referring to. May I read the Vedensky, by the way? Yes. Now, I, the reason I want to bring in Vedensky, if I, if I may, let, let me read it and then ask you like, which specifically and what contradicts. The reason I want to bring in Vedensky, right, so this is what they are, it, it, essentially what their, uh, what, their, um, what their program was, was a critique of pure reason. Right, that uh, that it is, uh, and that is. If I had more time, right, that is what I would sort of like read. Um, right, this kind of like uh, um, uh, it, something can be purely consistent, purely rational, and still be sheer meaningless nonsense, kind of. So and so, Vidinsky sort of puts it more programmatically here, if I may. Poetry only produces verbal magic, not actual. And so, the mean, by the way, this is written in his exile. They were roommates in their exile. So it's, they're literally writing this at the same time. Poetry only produces verbal magic, not actual. And so the means for reconstructing the world are unknown. I broke with understanding, with premise generalizations, something no one had done before me. With this, I, so to speak, conducted a poetic critique of reason, a more fundamental one than the other abstract one. I became skeptical that, for example, house, villa, a tower are connected and unified by our understanding of building. Perhaps shoulders should be connected to four. I carried it, this out in practice, in poetry, so as to prove it. And I became convinced of the falsity of established connections, but cannot say what the new ones ought to be. I don't even know if there must be one system of relations or there are many, and I am left with the core sensation of the world's disconnectedness and of the splintering of time, and as such as this contradicts reason, it means that the world is insensible to reason. And so tell, tell me, contradiction, and they, are, they do differ. Well, in Harms, uh, genuine art stands in the order of the set of primary reality, so it is reality, the art, mm -hmm. the verbal art for Harms. Uh, for uh, Vedensky, uh, at least judging from this uh, particular um, quotation, uh, poetry uh, is just uh, verbal magic, not actual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, here, the, couple, the primary distinction, of course, is in the person. Uh, uh, Vedensky was, uh, first of all, had studied mathematics formally and was a far, far, very much more devout a uh, Russian Orthodox person who also um, who also um, 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 uh, s uh, will suffer more greatly. He suffered. Uh, he was uh, uh, he was finally uh, arrested a second time as well in '41 and executed, but uh, essentially was under a death sentence. Um, 
Uh, and that's why the Great Notebook is so fascinating and is perhaps his first piece of ex proto existentialist writing because he's, he is sitting uh, at, uh, convinced that right, he's going to be executed. Uh, and again, so Harms has this, partly under the influence of his father, I'm sure, but a much more mystical, he's a mystic. Um, his, uh, he is as close as it comes in the Russian tradition as uh, uh, being sort of a representative of the Eurodivoy, this sort of like holy fool. He styled himself so, um, literally. He was just such a, uh, uh, such a um, um, misfit, literally. He went about the city in knickers and top hats and so on. Um, but also, uh, just filled with mysticism and superstition. He, not only he, did he date and preserve everything uh, obsessively, but there are even uh, like um, astrological signs for the exact time that something was, a, a great deal of numerology. Anytime the numbers appear, they have some, you know, some, some uh, uh, so there's that element of superstition. It's interesting that Vidensky preserved nothing. He had this higher reality, it doesn't matter what is preserved or not. Oh, everything that's preserved from Vitetsky was preserved in harms of suitcases. <laughs> so you would have to write per per personality, I think, has, yeah, and also write sort of whatever education and so on have to do it. Well, if I have a question about your own translation of harms. And obviously, this is not the first English edition of harms. There's George Gibbon, Harm. you know, there, yeah. So how Once is every it? Decade. Yeah, so how is your book different from all the others? Yes. And, and did you Thank look you. at the other translations when you tried them out? I had to. Yeah. Did I what? Yeah, I mean, did you, did you look at it before no, you tried really. it? I think I've read things here and there, but I did have to look at the table of contents yeah. and uh, actually create a table because I was ordered not to have more than 30% overlap with any of the other parts. Mm -hmm. um, we also address very different things. So uh, the first two books, by the way, were, were indeed monographs. Gibeon's from the 70s uh, was really part of a longer book called The Lost Literature of the Russian Absurd, with just a small selection of uh, Same with Neil Cornwell's book. Those are academics, right? One American, one uh, British. Uh, uh, the 80s, uh, early 90s book in England that is called Incidences. And he literally just looks at these little narrative stories. Matvey Yankilevich, who, by the way, we've known each other since we were kids, practically. So it's very interesting that we both. I mean, I could tell you more about the importance of harms, really, a post-war and contemporary. He's huge in Russia in terms of the, his influence um, uh, on the post, you know, po all the post-war generations through, from the 50s to the 80s. Um, he doesn't become published. They were circulated illegally until, he's not published in Russia until the 1980s. Um, so, um, uh, the overlap, yeah. So, Matvi, although he's actually interested very much in what I'm doing as an academic, actually focused on the early performance theater pieces. I did not even include any of that. I really start kind of like, a, and focus on the late work. Uh, I also, I believe, am the first one to, to, and this has only become possible in the last 10 years, is to establish a chronology for everything, to really to try to be able to, do, to, to, to trace the, his development. One, uh, so everything has become, the archives have become available online, um, um, uh, co uh, collected, uh, was published in the uh, first one in 1999, and since then has been sort of like more completed. Um, and um, uh, the problem there was, and I actually ran out of time and space because I was working from the outside in. When he has that crisis after the exile, he, start, he stops dating everything. All we know is that no, those notebooks are from the mid-30s. And so, partly, it was sort of this, like, uh, an attempt to, re uh, as a creative writing, writer of myself, to try to establish some sort of a chronology as a sense of what, you know, how that development was. But try to place it as sort of like in some order that it might have been written in. I'm sure there's something else that is distinct, right? And of course, no one, uh, you can't have uh, a selected without the one opus, magnum opus, which is again very fascinating to me because I believe it was conceived as a play. It, it was, um, uh, it is written with a, in four, as essentially in four acts, with a overture and a coda, 
That's a starucha. Yeah, starucha, right. And it's his only long, it's his only, right, very late in life, 1939, he sits down and writes this. The, the writing itself, the writing of it, is part of the subject of the, there's always like, in a lot of his work, right, there's an alter ego, uh, right, uh, a writer who's trying to write something sort of like that. Um, and so that kind of like towards the, the end of his life kind of sums up everything. So after that, and I believe mine is also the, the only one, the, the one that makes the largest selection of his poems. The poems, future, uh, sorry, Russian Absurdist poems are very difficult. They rhyme, it comes out very silly, right? Uh, yet a lot of them also have this very spiritual dimension. They're prayers. Um, they're very short, they're minimalist. Uh, but uh, uh, I was able to get about 40 of them into English, and I think that's probably a, a good twice as much as, the, uh, as Matvies, who was the first one to do. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, Can I? Yeah, go ahead. I would love to actually, since we mentioned it, and then get sort of terrific, I would love to close by reading a couple of short poems. I, I, I wonder, again, uh, could we uh, draw a parallel between uh, Harms and uh, Gogol, for example, and consider Harms as a continuation of Gogol's tradition as a parodist of a freakish little man uh, in Russian literature? Uh, I will have a difficulty finding it now, but... Gogol, uh, right, he actually ranks geniuses, and in his notebooks he has this rank. Gogol always makes the top five. <laughs> uh, he, Gogol is huge in this tradition. Sorry, Pushkin, Gogol, Fulgur. Right, every, right. Uh, right. Uh, sorry, whose quote was that? Uh, we, I think it was Dostoevsky, right? We all come from yes. Chenel, from Gogol's so over Gogol. Yeah. Uh, and again, it would take a long, long, you know. Uh, it's okay, I'll conclude, just conclude with two, two or three very short poems. Mm, okay. Right, come. Thoughts about a girl. And Lipovsky is a philosopher in their circle. Arriving at Lipovsky's once by chance, I noted only to myself in silence how pleasant it is on that rare occasion to be left alone one-on-one -on -one with a girl. And when she passes by a flutter, as if on air, not a word do I utter, and when with a knowledgeable hand she makes contact, you understand. And when she lightly as though dancing, sliding her lovely foot across the floor, proceeds to offer her perky breast for you to kiss, then it is impossible not to shout out loud and lovingly blow from her firm breast a moat of dust and recognize how touching your lips to her youthful breasts is pointless. Um, this is a tribute. Uh, there are tributes to all the other poems. I think that's fair. Nikolai Lenikov was the oldest of that generation. He was the ex first one to be executed in 1935. Again, this long story about the children's writer writers who were um, repressed. So, to Alienica. Conductor of numbers, friendship's snide mocker, what's on your mind? Will you renew your diatribe? Homer to you, a lowlife, and Goethe, uh, a silly sinner, Dante you laughed at, and only Bunyan was your guide. Your verses often humorous, often troubled, often not at all funny, but instead they saddened our hearts. Often they even stirred our ire and contained no art. Rushing headlong into the abyss of petty pettiness and rot, wait, turn back, where with your cold and calculated thought are you fleeing, forgetting the law of the crowd? Whose chest was pierced by arrow so morose Who's enemy to you? Who friend? And where's your gravestone? And I'll close with one last. Uh, two, if I may. Is that okay? Like, just good. They're so short. They're so short. So, um, just because at the very end. He gives up on poetry, actually. Last ones. These are the last ones 37, 38, 39. This is how hunger begins.
He starved for the last um, eight years of his life. He stopped being able to get work. Literally starved for the last eight years of his life. This is, this is 1937. This is how hunger begins. You wake early and full of life, but soon to begin. Sorry. This is how hunger begins. You wake early and full of life, but soon begin to weaken. The onset of boredom arrives, the sense of loss impending, of quickening powers of mind, followed by a peace descending, and then the terrifying ending. And the last one, literally one of the last things he wrote. <sighs> They shoved me under the table, but I was very weak and a fool. The freezing wind blew through my, the cracks and landed on my tooth. It was torturous for me to lie so, but I was very weak and a fool. The atmosphere is too cool for comfort at any time of the year. I would have lain on the floor in silence, flung open my, uh, my coat of sheepskin and wool, but it became insanely dull to lie so, for I am very weak in 